Good to see you. If you're new here, my name's Joel. I'm one of the leaders here at the church, and um, we're really glad you came. We're in the Bible. Uh, for the rest of the meeting, I'm going to be doing some teaching from the Bible. That's what we do uh, every week. And we're in the book of Ephesians, which is in the New Testament. I'm going to read the first five verses of chapter 5, and, uh, and then we will get into the subject of sex, sex tips, as the subject is. You'll be disappointed to know that I don't have any diagrams. Um, so we, we, we have a few tips to bring, but, but they're not very visual. Um, we will have some verses on the screens instead, if that's all right. So we'll go with verse 1 to 5, and I'll read them as we go through them. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But... Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Okay, so tip, tip number one, I have six, six sex tips. <laughs> I hadn't thought that that was a tongue twister before I got here. I have six of them, and uh, the first of them is decide about Jesus, okay? First tip about sex, decide about Jesus. You might think, what on earth has that got to do? I've never seen that in a sex manual, never seen that on a Channel 4 program. What's Jesus got to do with it? Well, everything, absolutely everything. And not in the way that you might think, See, the reality is people, people tend to uh, imagine when, a, when a, a Christian gets up publicly and says, I want to talk about sex, uh, that what he or she is going to do is uh, to call it something evil, you know, despise it, be rather ashamed of it. Uh, that's not quite what I want to do. I'm not, I'm not here to even try and reform society today. That's another thing that we might expect from the church. Christians are here, so they're, trying, they're constantly trying to tell us what we should do with our bodies. That's, that's all they're interested in, just telling us what we should do with our bodies. That's not true. That's not what the church is meant to be. That's not what Paul's doing in this bit of the Bible. He's writing to some Christians. He's not writing to the world. He's writing to a church. He's saying, listen, you, amongst you, this is how it should be. He's not trying to reform society. It doesn't really work that well when Christians like me come along uh, to a public place in a secular, as in, you know, not, not inside the church, but in the world outside, and try and say, well, from now on, could we just do sex this way, please, just for a while? Could we? I know you've been doing sex that way, but could we do it this way now, from now on? It doesn't get very far. <laughs> because, well, there's lots of reasons, but, but really, we're starting in the wrong place when we do that. In fact, we're kind of feeding the, the wrong impression that people already have. That, that God is basically, he's basically down on us. He's basically down on us enjoying life, enjoying pleasure. That's, that's what he's there for, if he's there at all. And in fact, because we have that view of God, we've decided that he mustn't exist. Because we, we really are quite into sex here in Brighton, aren't we? It's something that people are quite up for in Brighton. It's kind of a part of the culture. And the way we tend to think is sex is kind of, kind of good. It's kind of fun. I've, you know, if, I've heard it's good anyway. You know, and uh, apparently Jesus isn't really down with it. So he, he, can't, he can't be real. That's the process of logic we go through. I like sex. Jesus doesn't like sex. Therefore, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It doesn't, it doesn't stand up in a court of law. It's not great logic, but honestly, I think that's how thousands of us in Brighton think. That's how we think. Jesus can't be real because I like sex. I want, I, I'm so committed to, to this thing that I must have that anything that gets in its way is, is just an impediment that needs to be put to one side. This is the thing, though. You've got, to, you've got to hear me on this. Decide about Jesus first. 
Decide first if he's real. <laughs> That's the thing to sort out first. If he's not real, then you were right all along, and you can carry on regardless. If Jesus is not real, then whatever this book has to say about sex is utterly irrelevant. It's tedious. It's, it's, it's to be removed, withdrawn. It's not to have any involvement in our lives at all, especially not in the bedroom. I mean, who cares what an ancient book has to say about the bedroom? Nothing. It's irrelevant. But if you start in the right place, you'll start with, is, is Jesus real first? Because if he is real, then we've got far, far bigger things to think about than sex. Far, far more important things to sort out than the bedroom. So decide first if Jesus is real and then think about whether or not what he says about sex, what the Bible says about sex, can be worked in your life. And what you'll discover is when you, when you find out that Jesus is real, what he says about sex, well, it's kind of, he's kind of got a lot of authority. He rose from the dead. I think he's allowed to speak about things. And not only that, but here's the wonderful thing that we'll get on to before I finished. What he says about sex is actually wonderful news. It's good news. It's actually not narrow. It's broad. See, the Bible doesn't give us the idea of sex being an evil thing. That's come to us from the world outside. But because we've desired sex, we've, we've made up our minds about God. You may think I'm exaggerating. People don't really, we don't really think about that in Brighton. I, I, let me... Let me give you an example, one example, one amongst many who was very honest, uh, Aldous Huxley, okay, this is a, uh, a well-known thinker and writer, English writer, many of you would have read some of his books, uh, he, he was a brilliant man, brilliant intellectual, one of the leading thinkers of his time, he put it like this, we objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom, supporters of this system claim that it embodied the meaning the Christian meaning, they insisted, of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and justifying ourselves in our erotic revolt. We would deny that the world had any meaning whatever. Do you see what he's saying? Okay, what he's saying is we started with the insistence that we will have sexual freedom, we will do whatever we like with sex. Because that was the most important thing, we said, therefore, we must have a world where there is no meaning. We must have a world there where there is no God. So we worship sex because we don't want a God who is going to... Uh, therefore, we don't want a God who is going to ruin that. We've decided on a view of the world that fits around our sexual appetites. He was honest enough to say that. I think probably the only difference between Huxley and many of us is that he's just honest. He's really straight about it. But of course, if there isn't a God, and as if the Bible isn't true, we should put it aside. We should do what, I mean, even just this last weekend, I noticed in the news that in Germany now it's going to be passed as law that uh, babies will start to be registered as either one of three sexes. Not male or female, there will also be another one. There will be another box you can tick. And we might say, oh, that's, that's ridiculous, that's, oh, that's awful, that's just so foolish. And, and it is if there's a God. If there isn't a God, they're just being logical, aren't they? If there isn't a God, then why don't we have five or six boxes to tick? If there isn't a God, then who cares what we do with our body? Who cares what we do with anything? Who cares about anything? It is all an accident anyway, if there isn't a God. If there is a God, then we should take him seriously. Do you understand? We start with Jesus. Start with this decision. Is God real? If he's real, we really are wise to listen to him, to think about what he says. And we're wise to ensure that he is placed at the center and not ourselves. See, the story the Bible tells is a story of how God has worked a miracle, a glorious, mighty, epic miracle to rescue you and me from our own selfishness. The big problem that we have from the beginning is that we refuse to let God be God. We prefer to be God ourselves. We don't want to worship him. We want to worship the things he's made. And so we, we, we put ourselves in the position of God. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 5, verse 15, it talks about this in very clear terms. It says that, that he came so that he, we would be free, not to live for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and was raised. We, we get rescued from this selfishness. What we've done with sex is we've treated it for our own means. Instead of seeing it as a gift from God to be used for his glory with gratitude, we've selfishly used it for our own glory. We've made it all revolve around us and what we want personally. That's the problem. So, so the second tip is actually very relevant to that. The second tip is decide whether sex is a gift or whether it's God. See it as a gift. Don't see it as God. It is a gift. It's God's good gift, along with all the other many, many gifts, mercies, blessings that he's poured on us that we were singing about earlier on in the meeting. These are gifts that he gives and lavishes and is kind to give to us. And we're the narrow-minded ones when we say, this thing is about me and my personal gratification in this short life. No, that's narrow. That's so narrow. We have to have a broader view to see that there's something greater. There's a glorious meaning to sex. There's a purpose in it. There's, it, it lifts our heads if we understand it properly to worship God in thanksgiving and to use it to glorify Him. You might think, how do you do that? You know, there's, there's all kinds of questions go through the mind. We may touch on that before we finish, but, but the principle is important. that We see it as a gift. It's not God. It's a bad God. If you use sex as a God, you're worshipping something that will destroy you. You see there's a gift from God. There's a chance that it will actually lift you to, to give thanks to Him, praise to Him, to, to be grateful to him, see him as the, the one that you should live for and ultimately let your life revolve around him and not attempt to try and make something work out that's vice versa. See, there are those who want to deny that sex is a gift. The Bible even talks about them quite strongly. In 1 Peter, for example, chapter 4, the Apostle Paul, the same man that wrote this letter to the Ephesians, says in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, let me just get in my Bible, verse 1 it says, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. You expect he's going to talk about murderers, rapists, uh, drug dealers. He's going to deal, talk about thieves. He's going to talk about, I don't know, you name it, anything, any kind of vice, all the most vicious things that people can do. What is it he says? Those who forbid marriage. What? Those who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. He's talking about people who at the time when he's writing these letters were going around teaching that God is so anti the body and so anti-sex that it's very important if you really want to love God to not just never have sex, but never even think about it. Don't even get married. Refuse marriage. It's better to be single. That's more holy because the body is, a, is an embarrassing thing. Sex is an embarrassing. Sex is a degrading thing. The womb and reproduction and matter and all these yucky things. God is, is not matter. God is just spirit, so we must just be spirit. That was a very powerful and popular philosophy in the ancient world. It actually still is in the modern world in subtle ways. Sadly, even amongst Christians. Christians who get into this idea that God and sex are at opposite ends of the spectrum. God's like, Ugh, that repulsive thing. Friends, you couldn't get further away from the true God of the Bible. The God of the Bible rejoices in his good creation. He made it to be rejoiced in. He's glad for it. He's glad to give it abundantly so that we can live in a place of thanksgiving. And he says in verse 4, everything, God, everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Does that cause you to think differently? I wonder if you've ever thought of it like that. 
I'm sure there's at least some in this room who've never thought that God gives sex gladly as a gift. He wants us to rejoice in his gift. We've always thought of it as somehow tasteless and to be disdained and it doesn't really fit. No, 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 that's unbiblical. That's not Christianity. Christianity rejoices in this gift along with all the others God gladly gives. But as with all the gifts God gives, he gives them that we might enjoy them in the way he designed them. For his glory, to his honor, that we enjoy them appropriately. We enjoy them best, in fact. The more you enjoy them the way God designs them, the more you enjoy them full stop. Because he knows how they best work. He knows what it's for. He knows how it works. He knows how it brings the most true, lasting joy. If you want to get the best from fire, you have a fireplace. And you keep the fire in it. You, you put a grate around it if you've got small children. You, you think about it. You, you're careful with it. Why? Because fire is evil. Fire is a wonderful gift. Fire keeps the house warm. Fire creates a nice atmosphere in your front room. Fire is a blessing from God. How precious the gift of fire. How stupid to misuse it. How stupid to light a fire in the middle of your house and then complain when it burns down. How stupid we are with sex. Instead of thinking, well, this is a gift. This is to be used wisely. Who knows how to use it wisely? Who's the wisest person? Well, I think... God might know. God designed it. He's wise. He's good. And he gives clear instruction. Instruction that we might be surprised by. You go to the Old Testament, you get to the book of Proverbs, you get some verses there that you might be surprised are in the Bible. In fact, there's a whole book in the Old Testament that you'll be very surprised is in the Bible called the Song of Solomon. We won't have time to go into that. Um, and Because if we went into it, we'd never come out of it. Chapter 5 of Proverbs, it says this. In a, I'll get to the right verse. Hold on. Verse 15. Drink water from your, from your own cistern. This is a, some instruction to husbands. Okay, Every husband in the room, ears up, ears open. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Are you surprised at the language of the Bible? Not just the words like breasts and whatever fountain might mean, but words like delight, intoxicate, seriously. Why? It, that's, that's more shocking, isn't it? If you think about it, that it's talking about delighting, being intoxicated, like drunk. And it's, it's not just, by, the, the Bible doesn't mind if we get a little bit excited about sex. No, the Bible commands you. It says here, be intoxicated. Get really excited in your marriage to the glory. Let the fire blaze under the chimney. Let it blaze. Be full of passion. Be excited in that context. It's God's desire. He loves to bless. He loves to give this gift. So we're, we're wise to honor him and glorify him by seeing it in its context rightly. But let's look at the third tip. I need to move really fast now. Learn to love purity. Learn to love purity. This is a key in, in the battle to stay sexually pure, because what I'm saying, I hope you've picked it up, I'm saying that God loves marriage. God loves sex in the context of a man and a woman choosing under God to make promises that are committed forever. And in that context, to enjoy sexual union that may bring forth children. And even if it doesn't, it's still a gift from God. This is, this is what I'm saying, which rules out lots of stuff, doesn't it? Rules out lots. Rules out cohabiting. It rules out threesomes. It rules out pornography. It rules out prostitution. It rules out visiting brothels and strip bars. And 
It, it rules out, we could go through the list, I don't really need to, I think you get the picture. And so there's loads and loads of don't go there, don't go there, don't go there, don't, go, don't put the fire there, put it here, put it here, put it here, put it here. If all we hear is don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, I don't think it will work. What I think we need to do is learn to love the right things. Because what you love, what you desire, what you long and yearn for motivates you and changes you, doesn't it? Rules don't change people. Affections change people. Longings, motivation from the heart. So we must learn to love purity. And I say it because I think for many people, including people here who are Christians, who love Jesus and, and, and want to be sexually pure, one of the things that they struggle with is the feeling that they're missing out on something. Missing out terribly. And, and you can feel as though... I know I don't want to go to an orgy. I know I don't want to have strings of lovers. I know I don't want to go headlong into some obviously extreme version of immorality. Give me a break. That's not what I'm like. I'm not that kind of person. I just wonder if just this affair or this, this website or just visiting that place, just one fling, just a Taste it, just to feel what it's like. There can't be any real harm in just, just going halfway. The halfway option, it sounds like something very different than the extreme sin option, doesn't it? Extreme sexual immorality. And then you're just trying, you're just messing about. You just, come on, it's just, everyone does it anyway. It's just, come on, what's wrong with you? Just, just try, just want to try it. I'm missing out anyway. And I think many of Many of us as Christians are haunted by a feeling that we're, we're having our pleasures limited, held back. Our desires are being kept back by God. It's like we're like these kind of, you know, these kind of yapping dogs on a lead outside a butcher shop. And he's kind of throwing out all these bits of meat and we're going, ah! you know, it's like God can only control us with this leash called rules. It's like, God doesn't understand how hungry I am. I just long for this. I must have this. We think our problem is that our appetites are too great for God. That's the problem. We think if we just have it once, just a little bit. Two things to say about that. First of all, you never, ever, ever, ever get what you think you're going to get. If you say, I just want to taste it once. I just want to try it once. I just want to click on that site once. I just want to visit her once. I just want to see him once. I just want to have coffee with him. I just want to, if I just want to try this, I just want to go, I'm not going to go too far. I'm just going to touch her there, just the once. I'm just going to kiss her like that this time. I know we're not married. I'm just going to go this far. Just the once. You never get what you think you're going to get. Either because actually it doesn't quite satisfy you like you wanted it to, and so you must have more. Or because afterwards you feel filthy. And the thing that you thought was just a little innocent tweaking of it, you realize, oh no, I was totally tricked. I've walked into a net, I've walked into a trap. You're like a, a, an animal in the woods who's been walking into a snare, like a fox caught in a snare. I just went for this little nut, I went for this little, just, ah, oh, I'm dead, I'm caught, that's it, I'm finished. It never does what you think. We on the innocent side of temptation think we are in control. You're not. You take one step into sin, you lose control. Lost it. That's the first problem with that way of thinking. Second problem with that way of thinking is that it's a lie anyway. The idea that you're too powerful in your appetites for God. God's like, oh, I don't know how to keep these people here. <laughs> They're really hungry. These human beings I made, they, they, oh, they got an appetite, oh, they got a sex drive, man. It's like you know, people who say, I, it's all right for all those Christians. All those Christians, they clearly are completely deprived. They love God because they don't know any better. He doesn't understand that I really like sex. I think that's how people think. I think that's loads of Brightonians think that. You Christians, you clearly don't like sex. I really do. 
So God won't be good enough for me. He can't, he can't feed me. He can't feed my desires. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Here's the problem. Your desires are not too strong. Your desires are pathetic. Your desires are weak. They're weak compared to what God could give you. And to, to actually play around with sex, it's like, it's just not enough. See, God's made you to desire him alone. Him. God. The real God, not sex. The real one. When you get to know the real God, it's like your desires start to make sense. He starts to bring proportion to your life. What you need to resist the temptations of sin, sexual immorality, they are not that what you don't need is, is simple self will. What you need is to be transfixed by the real beauty. That's why the book of Matthew, Jesus, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Learn to love purity. There can't be anything. Surely, what, what, what else were you made for but to see God? When you start thinking of it like that, I, 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 if I carry on down the route of pornography, if I keep clicking on it, if I keep going this way, if I keep buying that stuff, if I keep downloading these, if I keep, if I keep sleeping with her, if I keep sleeping with him, if, if I'm denying myself. I'm not gratified in the end. I get flatter and flatter. The pleasure is less and less meaningful anyway. And that's what temptation does. It gives less and less pleasure for more and more slavery. You're losing out. You're losing out on beauty, purity. When people see the, the holiness of God, even in another person, isn't it staggering? When you see somebody who's lived a life selflessly, poured out their heart lovingly, joyfully for the poor, for the broken, for, for a disabled friend, for a, for a relative who's, who's uh, in some way in need. And they, they've just poured out their life for them. They've just lived for them. When you look at that, you, there's something about that. If you stop and consider it, it is stunning. You, you're seeing just something of the holiness of God. And you think that's just a little trace, that's just little crumbs from the table. What about the source? What about the meal? What about the real thing? God himself, to know his purity. I've told this story before to some of you. This is perhaps the best way I can think of of putting it. I got this from a writer called Sam Storms. He, he talks about the difference between Jason and Odysseus from Greek mythology. Do you know the story? Odysseus, he's got to travel home from the... Uh, the wars, the Trojan Wars. On his way, he passes an island where there are the sirens. Remember the sirens? These ladies on this island that sing out their hearts. And the sailors who go by are always so beguiled by the song that they end up sailing too close to the island and dashed on the rocks, they all drown. So the, the island around the sirens is just caked <laughs> in the water with all these shipwrecks and dead bodies. And Odysseus knows that he's never going to survive if he sails past them. But he can't resist the thought of hearing the song. He thinks, I want to be the first one to sail past the island and survive. So his, his uh, method is to get all the sailors on the boat to block their ears with wax. And, and he says, lash me to the mast. Tie me up. And he keeps his ears free. And they're all rowing past the island. And he's listening to the song. And he says, even if I scream at you, even if I do anything I can to tell you to stop and pull over to the island, don't do it. Don't do what I say. Just let me hear the song. And let me hear the song. And keep rowing, keep rowing, keep rowing. They're all blithely sailing by because they can't hear a thing. And he is in hell. He thinks he's going to enjoy it. He's thinking, I'm going to hear the song. He's in hell. Because he's hearing it, but he can't have it. He's saying, he's shouting, he's screaming, he's protesting. And they're carrying on. He's, he's in terrible conflict. Because all that's stopping him are these horrible ropes. His, his heart is in total conflict. What he desires is what he can't have. But then there was Jason, the other Greek hero, 
who did the same thing. He sailed past the island. And in the story of Jason, he, he doesn't get the ears blocked of the sailors. He, he, he says, let's, let's have Orpheus come with us on the boat. And Orpheus plays. He's a musician. His, his music is so enchanting that even the song of the sirens can't compare. And so they sail by, and the sirens start to sing, and no one even cares. No one notices, because listen to the music, listen to the, the rhapsody <laughs> coming from this, this beautiful musician. Listen, it's so beguiling, it's so enchanting, it's so bewitching. Who needs to sail over to the danger? You see, the Christian too often thinks he has to be Odysseus. He or she will, will try to lash themselves to the rules. I mustn't, I mustn't, I mustn't. Christians don't do that. Christians don't do that. God didn't call you to that life. God called you to be in the boat with the enchanted music. To be with Jesus, to be caught up with Christ is better by far. And he actually brings not just himself, but the gifts of God. Even sex, if you are to, to marry, he, he blesses you in such a way that you're able to give thanks to him even in the context of the gifts that he gives. You're able to say these are gifts given by God. Let me move on. Learn to love faithfulness. And there's an illustration of it in verses 1 and 2. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is an illustration right there. Paul's saying, look, this is what God's like. You have been changed and redeemed by God. Your God's kids be like your dad. Look at what he's like. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his kindness. He's truly loving. Why? Because he gave himself up. Sex without faithfulness is not love. Whatever Hollywood says, it isn't. Whatever the charts say, it isn't. I resent the songs that my children are already listening to. My daughter is eight. She's already listening to songs that lie. I hate it. Because it's, it's rubbish. It's not true. Sex without faithfulness is a lie. Sex is made for faithfulness, for covenant, the Bible calls it. Covenant, we don't use that word these days. It means making a promise before God, before men, that disempowers you. That's what faithfulness means. You'll get disempowered. It's not yours anymore. You're, you're now in a bond. You're in an arrangement where you are submitting to the other person and they're submitting to you and you're saying, we're in it together. That's it. We've become disempowered. That's why premarital contracts are an absolute contradiction. You can't do that. You can't do a prenup and then say make huge promises. You've just contradicted yourself. What you're doing when you get married is removing the right to pull out. You're saying, I I I'm disempowering. I'm limiting myself to this for something better than just me. I want to be free. I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. But you know what? I want even more to be with you. And so we're going to be together and we're going to limit ourselves to be something better together. Faithfulness. Loving faithfulness. The kind of faithfulness that God showed through sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us is at the heart of what it means to enjoy sex truly. It's disempowering. It's huge. And that's why sex and marriage go together. Some of you are not yet married and you're sleeping around or even cohabiting. For your own good, stop it. Make a decision. Because I love you, I tell you this. I'm not trying to close you down. I'm trying to open up your life to something so beautiful, to a, a new kind of love, a new kind of faithfulness that, that's different to what this world offers, but it's so much better because it's just like God. Just, we get to be just like God. We get to make covenant promises. That's what God's like. Some of you may be in a situation where you, you're in, you got, became a Christian recently and you're raising a child with someone who you're not married to and they're not a Christian yet. I understand. That's got to be worked through. We've got to talk with you about that, help you. That's not as simple. But you hear the point I'm making. Faithfulness is at the heart of this thing. Must move on for time's sake. The, 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 the passage finally does talk about the way we talk. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place. 
How do we deal with that? Well, I'm going to finish with two parts of how we deal with that. The first tip is be who you are. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, if you've come to know Jesus Christ already, filthy talk, it doesn't fit you anymore. Do you know what I mean by that? This is what he, he, he means. When you read down, he says, foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place. And earlier in verse 3, he says, these things must not be named among you as it is proper among the saints. He uses words like out of place or improper. Some of the verses in, the, in your translations might say not fitting, not fitting. You get the idea? It's like, it's like one of my kids who's 10 trying to put on what he wore when he was four. It just looks silly and it's uncomfortable. <laughs> when you become a Christian, you'll notice gradually, if not suddenly, that things that used to make you laugh aren't that funny anymore. They're just not quite that funny. Because you didn't laugh at them because they were funny anyway. <laughs> you laughed at them because it kept you in with certain people and because your friends laughed at them. There was, there was, it, the reason behind it wasn't innocent. But when you come to Christ, it's like the, those clothes don't fit. It's not just, well, Christians don't laugh that much anyway, so um, it really ought not to. I know it's funny, but let's pretend it isn't. <laughs> That's how we come across, isn't it, sometimes? I know we come across that way. But it's not true. It's very difficult, because you want I find it difficult, because I want to be friends. The guy's telling a disgusting joke. And I don't want to be the kind of, oh, I'm rather above that sort of thing. I, I want to you know, be his friend. So I'm, I'm just always trying to work this one out. But at the heart of it, I can't pretend that I find it funny, because I don't. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit me anymore. Do you know what I mean? See, the Holy Spirit's inside you. You've got a different heart. You, you just can't pretend that you're what you were. So, so whatever happens, we must walk through this. And, and if that means that we're scared, we're, oh, I'm going to come across as a bit of a prude. I'll, I'll be seen as prudish. Surely the worst thing that can happen to me is to become a prude. <laughs> it isn't. I can think of worse things than prudishness. People think you're a prude. That's fine. That's fine, okay? Be prepared. The Bible says things like flee from sexual immorality. Okay, that's, that's strong language. Flee. Run away. Sometimes you look a bit weird avoiding immorality, whatever form it takes. Porn, filthy jokes, films you shouldn't watch. Don't you watch films? What's wrong with you? Well, I'm sorry. Well, just flee it. Just run for your own good. You don't have to please them. You want to survive, don't you? The Bible says flee. That's like a military word. I've never seen a, a movie like Braveheart where after the, you know, when the guys are running, we got tired of the battle. The battle's getting a bit hard now. Most of us are dead. Um, I think we'll just call it a day, guys. Just, uh, it's been a wonderful fight. Um, I love what you did with that axe. That was really good. Um, should we swap shirts? Swap shirts? What do you think? <laughs> as soon as you try and placate, as soon as you try and make friends with sin, as soon as you try and just bring it in a little bit, you're dead. That's why the Bible says, run away, flee. Flee. Be, 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 all right, be prudish in your city. Whatever. Be, realize the biggest danger. I know there's a danger of coming across. I know that. That's true. I, I don't want to be stupid. I want to be a good, warm friend to people who, are, who think differently and talk differently. But the most important thing is that I walk free of sin. And I survive spiritually. And finally, stay grateful. Stay grateful. See, it's interesting, he says in verse 4, instead of all crude jokes, all filthy talk, what do we have instead? He doesn't appeal to them to tell clean jokes. He says, instead, let there be what? Thanksgiving. What does he mean? Does he mean when someone tells a dirty joke, say, praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Start a song. Get your guitar with a rainbow strap out. and play, you know, that what he's saying? I don't think that's what he means. I don't think he's saying, look, literally, say, say thank, thank you to Jesus when you hear it. What he means is, at the foundation of language, there is something, right? 
The way we talk is built on, there's, a, there's something at the heart of the way you talk. If, if at the heart of how you talk is godlessness, it will come out with your humor, with your, your kind of, the, the, the sort of style, the way, if at the heart of the way you live is thanksgiving, it will come out differently. It will come out, yeah, maybe with clean humor, but it won't be because you're trying to be clean and squeaky. It won't be because you're trying to keep the rules. It'll be because you're grateful, because you're full of God. You're full of joy. You don't really see it as funny anymore. You don't see the need. You're just joyful in Jesus, and it affects everything about you. So let's live thankfully. Let's stay thankful. Perhaps the musicians could come and join us.